So we're in this late model JK with an LT1 8 speed. Watch how this 8 speed shifts. You'll notice that it constantly keeps the engine in its power band. Which means whenever you touch the throttle, you accelerate. There is no waiting for it to downshift or to get into its RPM band. You can see how quickly it gets into 8th gear. So let's do a little comparison here to that 8 speed Gen 5. Look at the long legs of this Gen 4 6.2. So you'll notice that the 8 speed shifted more, and with the torque of the Gen 5 engine, it's keeping you in that power band, especially when it phases the cam. You know, a lot of guys ask me about where the Gen 5 came from, and I really think you got to go back to the small block of the 1950s. Around 1955, both Ford and GM were looking for better solutions to the flathead motors. Flathead motors basically meant that the head was a flat plate and the valves came up from underneath. They were a good, strong engine, but they really couldn't put a lot of power out. When you put the valves over a head valve, you put them over the head, you can get better flow, which meant more horsepower. At the same time, the metallurgy was getting better. A lot of guys don't know that it was really holding back engine performance in the early days, especially in the days of like World War I, was metallurgy and lubricants. Stainless steel exhaust valves, sodium-filled valves, you can get so much power before parts would start to melt. In World War I, a lot of advancements were made with metallurgy and oils, but World War II is where it really all happened. And where engine performance came from in piston or internal combustion engines, Internal combustion engines are where you actually burn the fuel inside a combustion chamber in the engine. External combustion engines are like steam engines where you burn it in a boiler and then apply that pressure to the top and bottom of a piston. And steam engines are what really drove the industrial revolution for centuries. But by the 1950s, we were ready for higher performance internal combustion engines. And the goal was to try to make an engine that was powerful, economical, and that could be mass produced. By the 1950s, we had some very high performance engines. Offenhauser, even Louis Chevrolet himself made a dual overhead cam, four valve head for the Ford motors. But the problem was they were one offs, they were hand built, they were exotic, Duesenbergs, superchargers. So they wanted to mass produce high performance V8 engines, not just old flathead fours or, or the flathead V8 like the Ford V8. And what a lot of that came down to was casting technology. The cores that go into an internal combustion engine are very costly in the manufacturing process. So both Ford and GM reduced the number of cores in their small block V8s back in the mid-50s to the point that they could start mass producing these. And then head combustion technology improved to the point where we could raise the compression up. We were starting to get better grades of fuel and better lubricant. We've been doing a lot of these Gen 5 builds. This is another new crate LT1 engine. This would be a Corvette LT1 engine. Direct injection, continuous variable valve timing, active fuel management, high compression. This really is the future. We've been putting the 8 speeds behind these. Soon we're going to be putting the 10 speeds. We're going to talk about the transmissions on a test drive. Hey guys, we've got LTs all over the shop. I know we drive these and I talk about these LTs, but let's take a little bit closer of a look at the swap. Now, we are going to be driving this JK with an LT1 8-speed to the mountain tomorrow, and we'll do a video with that. In the meantime, this is a late model JK with a new LT1 GM performance engine, new 8L90 transmission, and a remanufactured uh, 241J, which works fine with these LTs, by the These way. These are the GM Performance exhaust manifolds. They're stainless steel. They're a little bit different than production. You can see that this is a full-size hydraulic bolt-in engine mount. This is out of a Cadillac, so they ride pretty smooth. And there is no fabrication. These mounts just bolt in. We're running our standard accessory drive here. We have used the original JK power steering pump. You notice that we have not opened the system up. This is the stock reservoir, stock lines. We have our spreader tube here for the cooling system. This is a stock steering gear. And you can see if you tried to run an XD box that you'd have a problem here. Now there is some options for that by moving the water pump to the other side. But really if you have an XD box and you have a hydraulic ram, it's somewhat redundant. So I recommend you use a standard steering gear and a hydraulic ram on the bottom. This is a decoupling alternator to lower friction in these engines. This is our 
power steering mount that we manufacture here in house. This is a stock GM variable displacement air compressor. You can see how well it fits, and we got plenty of room to the axle. This is completely computer controlled by the GM computer. Coming around the back, you'll notice that the LT1 has a vacuum port rather than the vacuum pump of the truck engines. So we're going to go ahead and use that. We don't need the electric pump that the Pentstar came with. You'll notice that we have plenty of room everywhere. This is our standard transmission plate, which fits both the Gen 4 and the Gen 5 engine. This is a full-size, heavy-duty, dual-stud GM 4x4 transmission mount. This is our standard shifter bracket. This is the transfer case L bracket, which holds the stock transfer case lever. And if you run an Atlas, we have a setup for that, too. This is the vent for the transfer case. This is a transfer case range sensor, and that's kind of important because that tells the computers what gear the transfer case is in. Neutral, for high, for low, and ESP, or the different modes, change when you change transfer case gears. Also, the four-wheel drive indicator on the dash. So it's important that you have that transfer case range sensor. You notice that there's no mods to any of the transmission cross members. In fact, there's no mods or nothing drilled in the frame at all. Now if we come back here, this is a stock Jeep fuel tank pressure sensor. They added that in 2012 with the Pentstar engine. Prior to that, they didn't have it. We've been using the GM fuel tank pressure sensor for years because GM uses the closed loop feedback EVAP system. This is a GM vent solenoid and this has much better control than the ESIM or the EVAP system integrity monitor. There is a connector here which is a switch basically to tell the Jeep system what the pressure in the fuel tank is, but it's not analog, meaning it's not a variable signal. It's basically a switch when it hits a certain value. So the GM system is much more sophisticated and by using this sensor and this solenoid, we're basically mimicking the stock GM setup. Do you have to mount your canister back here? No, of course you don't. You can still run the muffler in the back and your main exhaust pipe just like stock if you like. We like putting the muffler over here because one, we do want to get that canister out of the way. Two, I think it sounds better. If you put the muffler in the back, it's a little bit quieter. It doesn't sound as aggressive or cool, but it's really that's your choice. On the LT1s, we run the full covers. You can run the valve covers if you want, say Corvette, Camaro, whatever. We got the insulation on the intake. And on these LT1s, or LT engines in general, they do make more noise because the direct injection has a high pressure internal fuel pump. So they can be more diesel-like and you want to run that insulation if you can. On the L86s, we really can't because the hood clearance isn't enough to run all the covers and the, and the insulation. However, I personally like the sound of the diesels. Remember that these two connectors in the back are identical. Why GM did that, I don't know but they are for your fuel pressure sensors, high and low, and your injectors, so don't swap those, otherwise the engine won't run. One of the nice things about our conversion for the last couple of years with the easy hardware is you can literally remove this engine and put in a different engine or even a stock engine. We don't open the braking system. This is your hydraulic control unit, or HCU, and this is your ABS module. Be careful with those, especially when you drop the body. This master cylinder is a stock JK, but a lot of you guys go with the JK8. Make sure that the O-ring on here is properly seated. If you lose sealing to this master, you're going to have an air leak, the engine's going to run lean, you're going to, you're going to throw codes and your brakes aren't going to work well. As most of you know, we now support factory harnesses, so everything's going to be pretty much plug-in just like GM intended it to be. This is your steam port on the LT. It doesn't have a cross pipe anymore like the Gen 4s. Seems to work really well. The 6.2s have a larger throttle body than the 5.3s which makes sense because the 5.3s don't breathe as much and having the smaller tube gives it a little more efficiency. This is the PCV on the LT. It no longer goes into the valve cover, at least on the LT1. If we come over here, this LT1 has been idling here for a little while. We're going to take this to the mountain tomorrow. So Let's open the hood. You can see this LT1 fits this JK pretty good. In fact, it looks smaller than the 3.6 did. Now, this guy has a lot of extra cabling and wires that aren't associated with a swap. These are just accessories and things that he has. And we're going to, of course, clean that up as much as we can. But overall, the LT1 fits in the JK very well. You can see how much clearance we have in the back of the firewall there. We can actually get to the heater hoses even with the engine installed. We have our stock power steering pump reservoir. Nothing's been modified there. We have stock power steering lines. Now, in these Gen 5s, we do have to modify the AC lines. However, these are stock air conditioning lines and we make some adapters to do Recently, that. Recently we've gone to a higher capacity coolant bottle. So on these LTs we actually remove the horn, put it over here by the TCM, and this gives us, I don't know, somewhere close to a gallon of capacity. If you look over here, even though this is an 8L90, we're running a dipstick tube. 
we found that we can run a dipstick tube on these 8L 90s which allows us to fill them up and check the fluid from the top rather than have to use a J-hook on the bottom to fill them up and inspect them. You can tell this JK was originally a Pentstar because if you look at the battery it's already been turned sideways. Considering the horsepower and torque these engines put out they idle incredibly smooth and at a low RPM. That's really the big difference I think between these Gen 4 and Gen 5 engines is you can still get the 450 to 500 horsepower performance but in an engine that'll sit and tick over at 450 RPM. One more thing I want to mention is we're running the Camaro SS variable speed fan. This fan only runs as needed which means it's not screaming so you can't talk when you're in the cab. In fact it's turning over right now but it's running at such a low speed I could practically reach in here and stop it. This fan is quiet, it's a 19 inch blade, it's very powerful and it's completely controlled by this computer. This computer has fan control for air conditioning, condenser pressure, transmission temperature, intake air temperature, engine coolant temperature, vehicle speed, and all the other things that we've talked about. So this fan is only going to run as needed and you're probably not going to really hear it very much. You notice that this MAF sensor has a lot of wires going to it. The reason is it has more sensors in it than the Gen 4 engines and the Chrysler engines. This has a mass airflow sensor, air intake temp sensor, and a humidity sensor. More information the computer gets, the better decisions it can make. And these LTAs give them a lot of information. So we're going to take this JK to the mountain and we'll see you when we get there. down this little hill when he's gonna bump shift down down in the first slide down the hill bump it up to second as we're coming out of the hill bump up to third fourth Another advantage of the 8-speed off-road is you have this diverse gearing, so you have that 4.6 low to crawl over stuff, but you still have tall gearing to get some speed up while in low range. As you can see, I'm in low range here. We're going to go down this little incline. I'm in fourth gear right now, going about five miles an hour, but if I want to slow down and just come over here to our bump shifter, bring it back into first, and you can see it pretty much brought this Jeep to a stop. We're just idling now down this hill. You don't even need hill assist. Now I'm going to bump it up one into second. And the thing is when I bump it into second, we're not going to get a lurch. And it's not going to, like in a four-speed transmission, pick up a lot of speed. It's just going to pick up a little. And now we're in second. So it's perfectly controllable. You have diverse gearing so that you can be in whatever gear range you want. Now I'm going to go to third, fourth, because we're off this mountain. Now fourth is actually a little bit too low for what I want to do. So 
let's just go back into drive. Let's get a little bit of speed up here. Fifth, sixth, seventh. We're in eighth gear now. And you can see it's easy to get wheel speed up on this trail, which would be more difficult if you had 530s, 538s with 40s and a four-speed transmission. In fact, I think we could comfortably get 40, 45 miles an hour with no problem with an eight-speed and these gears.